Hello, this is Pastor Jonathan Morgan, and I want to thank you for joining me today as we study the Word of God on the healing ministry of Jesus. And I believe today that you can receive healing. You can be healed even while we preach this message. Because while we're preaching the message, faith is coming to you. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. If we're sharing these scriptures, then, then faith is going to arise in your heart. And as faith arises in your heart, then you begin to expect God to do impossible things in your life. And when you expect him to do it, then that's when it begins to happen, according to the word of God. Now, our scripture text we've been dealing with is uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. It's the first scripture in the New Testament that describes to us the healing ministry of Jesus. And so it gives us a pattern of how Jesus ministered healing to the sick. And so it's his ministry, and he has come to live in us. So this ministry flows through us the same way as it did through him. And uh, so let's read this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So Jesus was, first of all, teaching and preaching. And then the Bible says, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, we pointed out in each of these sessions, the all manner of, or New King James calls it uh, all kinds of, is the same Greek word that is used in John 3.16 as whosoever. So Jesus was teaching and preaching and then healing whosoever, whosoever came to him. The scripture again and again tells us that Jesus healed them all. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When the even was come, they brought into Jesus many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. The Bible said that Jesus went to every city, every village, and preached the gospel and healed every sickness and every disease. I mean, there are many other verses through the Bible. Again and again, it tells us that Jesus healed them all. He never said no. And so how does his ministry work? It works through the preaching of the gospel. God anoints us with the power of the Holy Spirit to adequately communicate the truths of the gospel. And as people believe that truth, hallelujah, then healing comes forth in their life. Glory to God. Now, I want to turn over here to Mark chapter 16 as we continue in this message today. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus tells us, Jesus says, go into all the world and do what? And preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus told us exactly what message we are to preach. And that is the gospel. That's the gospel of Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed, Romans 1, 16. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And so the gospel is the power of God. When we preach the gospel, we are releasing the power. The power is not prayed down. The power is preached out. The moment we share the gospel, we are releasing the power of God. Now, that's true whether you uh, are preaching loud, whether you're preaching soft, whether you're preaching fast, whether you're preaching slow, it's the same. It is the, it is the gospel of Christ. There are many different people, many different personalities, many different styles. None of that matters. What matters is the fact that you're communicating the gospel. And when you communicate the gospel, you are communicating, you're releasing the power of God. Look what the Bible says. He said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Then verse 16, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now I'm going to ask a question there. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so my question is, what do you believe? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Believes what? Well, obviously from the previous verse, he said we're to preach the gospel. Then, he's, then, then the answer is, he who believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Then he says, but he who does not believe will be condemned or be damned. So again, the question, does not believe what? That is, does not believe the gospel. 
Now let's continue. Verse 17 says, and these signs, these miracles will follow those who believe. Again, believe what? Believe the gospel. These signs, these miracles will follow them to believe. So the gospel is the power of God. It's the power of God that saves me, but not only saves me, but when I understand the truths of the gospel and I believe it, it empowers me. These signs will follow them that believe, believe the gospel. Now, uh, traditionally in the, in the spirit-filled church, when we read that verse, these signs will follow them that believe, people immediately begin to disqualify themselves. Oh, they that, you know, these signs will follow them to believe. Well, when one of these days, one of these days, when my faith is big enough, when I get spiritual enough, when I get deep enough, one of these days, then these signs will follow my life. Well, <laughs> that's not what that Bible teaches. That's not what the scripture says. The Bible said, he that believes the gospel, these signs will follow them to believe. Amen. So the gospel not only saves me, heals me, but it also empowers me. Now watch what he says. He that believes the gospel shall be saved. And then he said, and these signs will follow them that believe the gospel. Then he says, he said, in my name, they shall cast out demons. So there is a part of the gospel that reveals to us what Jesus did for us in defeating the devil. Jesus, the scripture says, Genesis chapter three, uh, verse, uh, verse 15, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. Jesus already did that. Amen. The Bible said that in Colossians chapter two, that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. Jesus already did that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter two and verse 14, the Bible said that Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. Uh, the Amplified Version says, made him of no effect. See, Jesus did that. See, the gospel is, who is Jesus? What did Jesus do for me? F.F. Uh, Bosworth says that any believer can become a devil master overnight. In other words, the moment you understand what Christ did in his sacrifice and in his resurrection that defeated the devil, that rendered him powerless, that destroyed him, brought him to naught, at that moment, you have the power to cast out devils. Amen. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for 10 minutes or 10 days or 10 years. The moment you know that, and you believe that, you have power to cast out devils. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe. Believe what? Believe the gospel. Amen. And then he says, in my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Let's read on. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. Now let's look at that for just a moment. And I realize that there are some, there are some groups that use those verses to, uh, to tempt God. In other words, they handle snakes and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. But uh, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you and I being on the front lines of world evangelism. And, and the reality is many times in those remote places, there are snakes, there are serpents there, but we're not afraid of them. We go anyway. But he says, you shall take up serpents, and if you drink any deadly thing, now watch that now, you shall drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. Now again, Jesus is not talking about you uh, drinking poison just to demonstrate how spiritual you are. He's telling you that there is, an, uh, there is a power that has come into you. There is a power that has come upon you through understanding the gospel that makes you immune, that gives you immunity that protects you. I mean, look at the apostle Paul on the, in Acts chapter 28. And, uh, and there he is, he's gathering a bundle of sticks and, and while he's building a fire and the Bible says there was a, a snake that came out of that wood and attached itself to Paul's hand, which he shook it off into the fire. But he, there, he should have swollen. He should have suddenly fell down dead. The people of that, that island were watching, expecting him to die suddenly, to swell up and drop dead suddenly, but there was no effect. Why is that? It's because 
There is something in the truth of the gospel that when we know it, when we believe it, when we focus upon that, it gives us power. It gives us protection. It gives us immunity. Now, that immunity, then the, Jesus goes on to say, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That power comes from us understanding and embracing and knowing the finished work of Christ, what Jesus has done. <laughs> and, uh, and so we have to understand the gospel. I mean, it's my experience in traveling and meeting, pre preaching on a lot of churches and uh, do, pre going to a lot of nations that so many people have a very shallow understanding of the gospel. And so because they have a shallow understanding of the gospel, they keep looking for something else. They're looking for a magic formula. They're looking for some uh, uh, man of God to impart their anointing to their life. And so, and so they're, they're missing it. Everything seems so, so dark and so mysterious. But Jesus really simplified it. Jesus said, believe the gospel, preach the gospel. When we believe the gospel, it not only saves us, but it empowers us. And so there are different parts of the gospel. In other words, who is Jesus? What has Jesus done for us? That we need to dive into the word of God and study that out and find out exactly what that is. And the moment we discover that, that is the foundation of our faith. We believe that. And that releases that power into our life. It's not because you are a special person of God or a special man of God with a special anointing that no one else has or can have. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in the anointing and we honor and respect all men and women of God. But I'm here to tell you that redemption is the same for everybody. And the gospel is the power of God that transforms people's lives. Now, there are two parts to the gospel that I want you to see here as we look into that. Now, I want to stop right here and remind you that, that, that uh, healing is part of the salvation of the Lord. We talked about that yesterday. It's part of salvation. And in the gospel, there is that part of the gospel that speaks about healing. What part is that? Well, it's what we've been saying. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 which says what? Surely, the Bible says, Jesus, he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows, which is, which is the literal translation is, surely he bore our diseases and carried our pains. So Jesus, at the same moment, nailed to the cross, that he bore our sins, he also bore our sicknesses, and he bore our diseases, he redeemed us from our sins, he also redeemed us from our sickness. He redeemed us from disease. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the gospel. We believe that. Now, let's move on and look at some other parts of the gospel that are relevant here. It's important for us to embrace. Okay. Number one, the gospel gives to us the good news of God forgiving us of our sins. Now, there are three, actually three parts to the gospel. Number one, who is Jesus? I believe that. Number two, what did Jesus do for me? Everything he did was for me, was for you. And I asked myself the question, what did he do for me? Well, when I find that out, I believe that. But there's a third part, and I want you to hear me. The third part is, is believing that I have what he died to give me. I have what he shed his blood to accomplish in my life. I mean, think about that. If Jesus shed his blood in order to make you righteous, but then you don't believe you're righteous, then in effect, you have denied the truth of the gospel. So if I'm to believe the good news, if I'm to believe the good news, I believe Jesus is who he says he is, I believe Jesus did what the Bible reveals that he did. But then number three, I believe it's true in me that Jesus died, shed his blood to wash my sins away. And so I accept that I am forgiven. I am made righteous. The good news is God has forgiven all of your sins. 
That is the good news. That's the truth of the gospel. Hallelujah. Now, I want you, I want you to, I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible that happened in the ministry of Jesus that speaks to that very point. In, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 9, they bring to Jesus a man that is paralyzed, laying on a bed. Four of his friends have carried him to Jesus. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw the paralytic, he said to him, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, another translation says it like this. Young man, be happy. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is so powerful. Jesus is so powerful, he preached the gospel to that man who is paralyzed. He preached the gospel to him in a one-sentence sermon. One-sentence sermon. He said to the him, be happy. Your sins are forgiven you. Now, you know the story. Suddenly the Pharisees, they're having a hard time. They're accusing Jesus of blasphemy because he's forgiving sins. And so Jesus turns his attention from the paralyzed man laying in the bed and is having a conversation with the Pharisees about this issue of forgiving of sins. Now, this stop right there. Now, while Jesus is having this conversation with the Pharisees, the paralytic is laying there in his bed on his cot. And what's he doing? He's obeying the word of Jesus. Which is what? He is being joyful. He's being thankful. His sins are forgiven him. You can just imagine. He's laying there in that bed and he's thinking about what Jesus just said. My sins are forgiven. All my sins are forgiven. Jesus told him to be happy. And man, he's just getting happy about that. Oh, hallelujah. My sins are forgiven me. Praise the Lord. I'm forgiven of all my sins. There's nothing against me before God. He's just praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Hallelujah. So what is he doing when he's obeying that? When he is accepting what Jesus said and being joyful because his sins are forgiven him. He is believing the good news. He is believing the gospel. So while he's believing the gospel, there's power working in him. There's power working in him. He's believing his sins are forgiven given him. Jesus has forgiven all of his sins. Joy is bubbling on the inside. Hallelujah. And uh, then Jesus turns to him and says that you might know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He says to the man in the cot, take up your bed and walk. Hallelujah. And praise God, the man is healed. He leaps to his feet, carries the bed and goes on his way. Amen. But notice that how Jesus initially released the power in that guy. He preached to him the gospel. He gave him the good news. He told him, be happy. Your sins are forgiven you. You know, I find so many people, oh, they know the truths of the gospel, but they still carry some low-grade sense of inferiority, some low-grade sense of unworthiness or being condemned. They don't feel like they're good enough. You see, when I reject those feelings, I look at what Jesus has said and what Jesus has done, and I embrace that for myself. I believe I am forgiven. I believe that I am made righteous. There's nothing against me before God. When I believe that I'm forgiven, when I believe that I'm made righteous, I am believing the gospel. Jesus is my savior. He bore my sins. He shed his blood. Number three, I believe is so in my life. I believe that I am forgiven. Amen. Now, let me read you some scriptures here that speak to that. Acts chapter 13 and verse 39. Look at what the Bible says. We're talking about the good news, the gospel. Verse 39. The Bible said, by him, everyone who believes, everyone who believes is justified from all things. I love that. But by putting my trust in what Christ has done, the Bible says that I am justified from all things. Now, what does it mean to be justified? To be justified, I like the, you know, the, the elementary, really elementary uh, uh, meaning of that. We give to that, and that is justified just as if I'd never sinned. That the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Christ was so effective and so powerful that he justified me. He made me just as if I have never sinned. 
The blood of Jesus is so powerful that it washed me and made me just like sin had never stained my life. Hallelujah. He justified me. He made me righteous. The Bible says from all things, everything. There's nothing you've ever done. There's no sin you've ever committed. There's no mistake, no, no mistake that you've ever made that's big enough for which he cannot forgive you and does not forgive you. Receive that today. Receive that today. See, the devil, the Bible says, is the accuser of the brethren. He brings accusation. He brings a condemnation. He brings his, he points out every little, every little flaw. Listen, we don't look in a mirror looking for perfection. Where do we look for perfection? I see perfection in Christ. I look at Jesus. He is my righteousness. He is my perfection. He has come to live inside of me. I believe that I am, I am forgiven. Now, look here in Romans chapter, in Romans chapter four, look at what the Bible says. Romans chapter four, the Bible says that in verse three, and what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The moment you turn from your sins and put your faith in Christ, in his sacrifice, in his blood, in his uh, work for you, the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension to heaven. The moment you put your faith there, God counts you righteous. Think about that. He counts you righteous. He counts you righteous. And if God counts you as righteous, then he treats you as if you are righteous. Amen. Now, I have here in my hand, I have a $100 bill. Amen. I have a $100 bill. Now, let's just suppose I had, a, I had 10 of these in my hand, and so I'd have $1,000. So what am I going to do? I'm going to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Amen. So how do I count that piece of paper? I count it as a $100 bill, which means what? I treat it like it's a $100 bill. Amen. Uh, I, I, obviously, that's a little bit different than the way I would treat a $1 bill. But this one, I count as a $100 bill. Now, the moment you put your faith in Christ, God counts you righteous. He counts you righteous. And he treats you as if you are righteous. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. He counts you as if you're righteous. Now let's read on. Let's move on because we get over here to the end of chapter four and the Bible says that Jesus was delivered up for our offenses. He was betrayed. He was crucified for my sin. Then it says, and he was raised up. He was resurrected for my justification. What does that mean? That means that when God raised Jesus from the dead, that means that God accepted his sacrifice for all of your sins. That means that in the mind of the righteous judgment of God, your sins have been paid for. There's no punishment left. Your sins have been punished. There's no punishment left. Hallelujah. God has declared you righteous. God has counted you as righteous. Uh, chapter five, verse one, it said, therefore being, being justified by faith, we receive, we embrace this by faith. Faith is what we believe in our heart, but we also confess with our mouth. So what do I say? I say, I am justified. I am just as if I'd never sinned. I am righteous because of the blood of Jesus. I receive that. I have that. I believe that. See, when I believe that, I'm believing the gospel. You see, some people, they believe Jesus died, they believe Jesus shed his blood, but they don't believe that they are what Jesus died to make them. Well, make that step now. Make, say, I am the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Now, let's, let's read on. Verse 9. Verse 9, he says, much more than ha, uh, be, ha, having now been justified by his blood. Now, I read that scripture to point out one little word there. Being now justified by his blood. When? Now. When does God make me righteous? Some people think that, oh, yeah, one of these days when the trumpet sounds and, and I'm on my way to heaven and, you know, going up, flying up to heaven, then, then that's when God makes me righteous. Some people think, well, when I die and then to get to heaven, God makes me righteous. No. 
Death doesn't make you righteous. The rapture doesn't make you righteous. What makes you righteous is the blood of Jesus. That is applied right here, right now. Being justified, made righteous by his blood now, right now. When the blood of Jesus is applied to your life, the blood makes you righteous. You right now are as, by the blood of Jesus, are as righteous as you'll ever be. You're as righteous right now as you'll be when you get to heaven. Because heaven and rapture and resurrection and death, none of those make you righteous. The thing that makes you righteous is what's applied to your life when you bowed your knee and you accepted Christ and the blood of Jesus was applied to your life. That is what made you righteous. Hallelujah. You are right now, by faith, the righteousness of God. Amen. Now think about that. I believe that that is the gospel. Now, one more point I want to see because the gospel reveals that he made you, he made you righteous. Now in verse, uh, in, in verse, verse 10, I'm going to read this verse 10, Romans 5, 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now notice that phrase saved by his life. I am saved by his life. Now, I love that. There are two words there that are put together. Sozo, salvation, the salvation of the Lord, and the, and the Greek word zoe, meaning life or the life of God. I am saved by his life. I am saved by his life. Now, when you speak about being saved by his life, people can think about life and think about uh, the history of someone's life. In other words, we could talk about men, famous men in history, about their life. We could tell their life story. But with Jesus, it's different. Because now we can look at, at, and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we can read the story of his life. But then Jesus died, but then something happened. What happened was God raised Jesus from the dead. And the moment God raised Jesus from the dead, what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is no longer simply a historical record. What we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a description of a kind of life. It's a description of the substance of his life. Amen. The Bible says in John 1 that in him was life. In him was Zoe. In Jesus was the life of God. The life of God, the zoe, is the very substance, nature, and being of God. God saved you with that life. In other words, the moment you accepted Christ as your Savior, the blood of Jesus washed you. He justified you. He made you righteous. And at that very moment, God took the very substance of his life, and he poured that into you. Hallelujah. And that life was so powerful that it recreated you on the inside. As the Bible says, if any person is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. You become a new creation, literally a new species of being. Hallelujah. You are a human with the life of God inside of you. The life of God inside of you, praise God. That life is, has in it everything that was ever in the life of Jesus. That life is miracle life. That life is healing life. That life is resurrection life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That life is inside of me right now. Amen. I love that scripture. Hebrews 12, 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. This life, the Bible said in John chapter one that of Jesus in him was life and the life was the light of men. I mean, if you could see that life in the spirit, it shines as brighter than the sun. It's a consuming fire and that God has poured that life inside of you, that life, the life of God on the inside of you. Hallelujah. God has made you righteous through his blood and poured the life of Jesus, the resurrection life, the healing life, the miracle life of Jesus inside of you. And that's why you're healed. That's why I'm healed. That's why I have immunity. 
That's why Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they'll take up serpents. And like Paul, that when the snake bit him, the venom had no power. It had no effect because not only was there human life in Paul, but there was divine life. There was the God life. There was the Zoe life, the resurrection life of Jesus inside of him. And that same life is in you. That is the revelation of the truth of the gospel. I believe that. Not because I'm such a great person. I believe that not because I regard myself as special. I believe that because that's the gospel. That is the truth of the gospel. I believe the gospel and the gospel is the power of God. I believe that the gospel that reveals that I've been made righteous and the life of God has come inside of me. I'm full of the life of God. Hallelujah. And because I'm full of the life of God, sickness, disease, cannot exist. It cannot exist. Hallelujah. My life has become like the, you know, you've seen those bug zappers. Amen. People set out on their porch during the summertime. It's full of electricity. And the moment that, that insect, that, that mosquito gets close to that thing, zap. I mean, there's a zap and that, that old bug is fried. That life of God is inside of you. Amen. Now, somebody said, well, well why doesn't it work? Listen, all the time. It does. It works all the time. But this thing with God, it depends on what you're looking at, what you're believing, what your focus is. Peter demonstrated that. As long as his focus was on the Lord Jesus Christ, the power that was in Jesus was also working in Peter so Peter could do what Jesus could do. So Jesus is walking on the water, so now Peter can walk on the water. He was focusing on Jesus. But the moment he lost his focus, he started looking at wind. He started looking at waves. He's no longer focused on Christ. Guess what happens? That thing just don't just isn't working now, and he begins to sink. But the moment you look at that reality, you are the righteousness of God. You are full of the life of God. Hallelujah. That life inside of you, it heals you, and it gives you immunity. It protects you. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I want to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for every person watching me right now. I thank you for the truth of the gospel. I thank you right now that people are being healed as they watch this video, as they receive this message. Lord God, I thank you that every bit of guilt and condemnation, the load of remorse and regret falls off of their life. Thank you, Lord. And healing surges into their body and with new life in every organ of their body, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Amen.